Welcome back to Trailblaze. This is Jamal Simmons. I'm Nayara Haq. This is a show about the America that we are becoming. All right. I'm excited about this week's episode because I've been waiting to talk to Nayara all week about all the things that are going on right now. We're all following the news. We're seeing what's happening. We're a few weeks out from Election Day. The polls are moving, but they're still not all the way there. And you keep hearing people talk about this concept. We all think we know what it is, but they talk about it all the time. It's about the Electoral College and what is the Electoral College and why is the battleground so important? These battleground state polls, the battleground state numbers, why is this so important for this election? So we're going to talk about this today, right, Nair? I mean, Jamal, it is this weird message that we get that every vote counts, make sure you vote. But then you hear in the news attention focused on states like Pennsylvania and Nevada and Arizona. And it's actually all part of a bigger plan of how the powers that be, the powers that know how things really work, precinct by precinct, have, as you call it, playing the system, but not really playing it fair. Yeah, totally. And so we're going to have a great conversation today also with a really good friend of ours, Christina Reynolds. Uh, Christina Reynolds, who was at Emily's List, is at Emily's List today, has been all over the Democratic Party. She's worked for candidates that you have heard of, some of them you haven't heard of, but she's worked for a lot of candidates, a lot of women, and she knows a lot about how this system works. So I'm excited to talk to Christina. I think you are too. I am. And Jamal, I did want to make sure that we also talked a little bit about what's actually been happening, right? Because it's not as if the election being only 40 some odd days away, everything is set and good to go. I mean, there, there's voting underway in many states, early voting, yet people are still trying to challenge the rules. In Arizona, the Republican Party is like, oh, you 100,000 voters. Mm, we don't think your citizenship records are up to date. Sorry. Yeah. So, all right. So exactly what we're hearing is all these states that everybody's talking about in the battleground. We're also finding out that it looks like Donald Trump and the MAGA forces on the Republican side are just trying to work the refs. They're trying to work the system, change the rule of the game before the actual election day. So we don't really know how things are going to shake out. And then they try to win this game in overtime and work these refs. So you've got Arizona in Georgia on Friday, last Friday, Georgia's election board, let me just read this so I get it right. Mm -hmm. On Friday, Georgia's election board ruled that ballots must be hand counted by local precincts in spite of concerns from election officials and, and opposition from some state officials. The board ruled three to two to require ballots to be hand counted on top of the already occurring machine count. The decision came with less than 50 days before Election Day. Even prominent Republicans, such as Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, had raised concerns in the past over the hand counting of ballots. This is going to take forever. It's going to be a mess. Who knows how exact the hand counts are going to be? They're always a little bit of fuzz in the hand counts. But this is just to create enough chaos mm -hmm. for the Trump forces to be able to argue something in court and keep this election played out till January. And it ties back to Georgia being the place that Trump called and said, hey, find me, you know, 10,000, 12,000 more votes. Like, help me out here, buddy. Right. Because he was looking at which states he could win. Arizona also got under his skin because that was the first state that ended up being called by Fox News that started the slide towards Biden winning. So a lot of this is part of Trump's psychology, but it goes much bigger than that. Every state that we're starting to see where these challenges are coming, where they're trying to limit voting, not give more people the ability to vote, but limit voting, they're all states with significant minority populations. That's right. And so as we're thinking about how America's changing, right, the America we're becoming, what you're seeing is there are some states of the anchor states for this change that's occurring, right? These states, particularly along the Sun Belt, so many more of us live in places like California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, even Texas, uh, Louisiana, Georgia, into North Carolina. So all these states that are now what's considered to be battlegrounds or right on the bubble of the battleground are states with considerable Lat Latin American, uh, Latino American, uh, South Asian, African American, mm -hmm. big populations of people of color. And we're also starting to see, because of the way things are changing, um, a lot of college educated whites who have maybe made some made some money or mm -hmm. uh, decided to move after COVID to some place that's a little bit more spacious for their family. They've moved to places like Florida and Georgia and North Carolina in order to be have to have a different kind of a lifestyle. So the country's changing a lot and we're seeing it happen in these 
battleground states. And, and while we're seeing it play out in voting, let's not forget that there's a whole machine that was well before this election was even underway about making sure that the Republican Party or Donald Trump or only certain types of people were able to vote freely. And this is why I'm really excited that Christina is going to be joining us in just a moment, um, because she's going to help us understand this idea of where votes count and what is a path to victory actually look like for someone like Kamala Harris? Yeah, you know, the Electoral College is one of these things that we've kind of wrestled back and forth with about a lot over the last few years, because um, Democrats have won the electoral, uh, has won the popular vote in many of these elections in every national election since 1992, except for George Bush's, George W. Bush's reelect in 04. So the question is, do we really want a system where the majority of people, majority of American voters are the ones who choose the leader? Or are we trying to have a system where it's game just a little bit so that people who maybe aren't in the majority still get to retain power? And as we really wrestle through America over the next 250 years, because here's the thing, this is 2024. And 2026 is going to be the 250th anniversary of the United States of America. The person we choose to be president this November will be the president of the United States at our 250th birthday. They won't just be looking backwards. This is the person who will be charting the course for the next 250 years of this country. And do we want that person to be somebody who thinks the 1950s or the 1920s or the 1890s with robber barons and women don't get to vote and black people are being segregated? Do we think that this is the person that ought to be the leader of this country at that moment? I just don't think so. Oh, well, Jamal, there, apparently there are plenty of people who still do. Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. All right. Well, next, we're going to talk to our good friend, Christina Reynolds, and we're going to bring her in right now. Christina, how are you? Um, and then let's pick up with the takeaways at the end of Christina's segment. Oh, you wanted to do it as a separate one. All right. Okay. All right. Jamal, this is this is what I found so fascinating about the election math that Christina was talking about and how it connects back to what we were just talking about, the browning of America. The idea that we have 41 million new voters uh, by this election, the majority of the voting population will actually be under the age of 45. It always used to be, oh, seniors vote and young people don't. But Taylor Swift overnight registered 300,000 voters. I doubt they were in their 50s, right? So this new population that we have, and it's more brown, America's going to be majority minority by 2040, all of that is, is, is playing into which states are being focused on to limit access to the ballots. It's this idea of immigration in North Carolina, of Latino votes in Nevada and Arizona, it's all connected. Yeah, it's absolutely all connected. And I got to tell you, it, it is... I got, it's, it's one of the things that worries me, right? Because as the country yeah. changes, we've never really seen a democracy that's gone through this kind of uh, diversification at the same time. And as the country changes, there are people who are really bought into the old America. It's like, you know, the old America, we just can't quit you, right? This idea that, you know, this 1950s Harriet, you know, Ozzy and Harriet America, I didn't even watch Ozzy and Harriet, even in reruns, <laughs> um, you know, but I've seen these images of, you know, the little family, like sitting at the table, doing whatever with the house coat. Like, this is not the America that most people have grown up in, and we just don't know it. I mean, that was a, I always think about <laughs> the 1950s and 60s, the only diversity on television at that point, other than like, I don't know, Amos and Andy or something, <laughs> was uh, Lucy and Desi, right? <laughs> was I Love Lucy show. Yeah. And on that show, it was an interracial marriage, but they never kissed, and they didn't even sleep in the same bed, <laughs> right? So they were only really married, that, and that was like it's some big concept. And, and, and Desi Arnaz today would be checking the box, white, Hispanic, right? When you have like the ethnicity, <laughs> which one are you? Like clearly that's a Cuban American thing that he'd be doing. It's, you know, how we count people, how we judge people, how we, how we self-identify, all of that does play out. And of course it's playing out in our politics. The one that really got me from this week, and I mentioned it um, in our conversation with Christina, J.D. Vance, right? He's really like riled up at this rally and he talks about, uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, legal migrants or illegal. He's like, you know what? 
I don't even care if they're if they're legal. Right. I'm just like, oh, I'm sorry. What? Sorry, sorry. Man married to South Asian woman say what? Like, <laughs> oh, you you said it out loud. What we have all kind of heard in the undertone or the signaling, which is it really is about maintaining a very particular look about America and not about the legality of how people are actually getting here. And just remember, the guy, this, the guy that Vance works for, Donald Trump, has been saying this for years. People just didn't think he was really serious about what he was saying. One of the first things he did when he was in office was uh, the ban at the airports, right? It was the travel ban. The second thing that he did when he was in office was that he the child separations on the border, when he was putting kids in cages on the border, and there were people who were like showing up yelling at those of us who were unhappy about it, saying that we were wrong, <laughs> right? For being upset that we were separating kids at the border. And Donald Trump said he wanted to limit immigration from what he called shithole countries. Those shithole countries happen to be people where black places where black and brown people lived. Mm -hmm. And he wanted more immigration from places like Norway. Hmm. Interesting. Less from Somalia, more from Norway. Well, so you let's, fill in the blank. Let, let's fact check a little bit of Donald Trump there. Of the immigrant populations in the United States, the population that has contributed most to the economy with high salaries the highest educated population, Nigerian Americans. It's actually not, people think Indian Americans, they're up there on the list, but it's Nigerian. And he banned migrants from that country, right? Uh, Somali immigrants, many gathered in Minnesota. It's leading to the diversity, you know, like the democracy of Minnesota. That's why he was triggered by Somalia. So these are all come back to the idea of how America looks, but also what could potentially keep a certain class and power for the future because they're afraid of where the population is actually going. So the end, at the end of the day, Nayara, I think, I think um, from our conversation with Christina, mm -hmm. from the stories that we've talked about today, this is a real question about how we wrestle through this election to make sure every American's vote counts and that people of color in particular have their votes counted and that we aren't embarking upon some second Jim Crow type yeah. style government we're governing, where we are limiting people's ability to have their votes counted in some of the most important ways in the most important elections. I think that's what the Trump forces are up to. And I will just end it with this thought then, Jamal, that voting is the most fundamental right that we are given in the Constitution. This is the way that we are told that we are able to elect the people who will help govern and keep us together. So yeah, every vote counts and we should make it easier for people to access the ballot and be heard. All right. Well, I want you to be heard on this particular podcast every week. So I want people to listen. Tell some friends about it. Come and check us out. Uh, we are here uh, to keep talking about this. So tell all your friends to come and check out Trailblaze. And don't forget, give us a good review if you liked it. I think you do that right down there. Is that where they do it? Underneath? Down there? Some stars. They just look. <laughs> Yeah, stars, and then they click on it. Yeah, so just do that. Trailblaze, we'll be right back next week. It's good to talk to you. We need to sign off. Yeah, working on our ins and outs. I mean, you could just do same time. All right, Nara, same time next week. If we're leaning in on the, this is just the two of us chatting it up with friends. Mm -hmm. No, nope. oh, now we can. There you are. It says it's uploading ninety nine percent, ninety eight percent, ninety nine percent. Oh, so we both each do a goodbye. Mm -hmm. Do we need to do Okay, I mean. Yeah. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves.
This is the backup phone, though. That's my backup phone. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to send me the link and I'll click on it from email and see what happens or no? Because there is a cloud on this. Okay. Yeah. Did it... The board looks like it's good. And in fact, I can see, you know, they have that microphone and the side panel under my face it goes from green to yellow when i talk so it like mm -hmm. but i mean that that means that it's going pretty right like it's getting a lot or i don't know it, it's working so it's working on the board it's working on the screen so i don't know the notes keep saying here Okay. You gonna email it? Yeah. Hello, Christina. So glad that you could join us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hello. And for those of you who don't know Christina, um, Christina Reynolds is a political strategist and communications professional. I'm going to say a little bit about you. She currently <laughs> serves as the senior vice president of communications and content at Emily's List, the nation's largest resource dedicated to electing democratic pro-choice women. How's that? But before that, she's been everywhere. The Obama administration, the uh, Democratic Communications Director of Barack Obama 2012 re-election campaign. Were you at the DCCC at one point or am I making I was that at up? the DCCC in 2005 and 2006. See? Which some See? of us may in my remember brain. is when we took the House bet that we made Nancy Pelosi speaker for the first time. So, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. I'm seeing a thread here in your trajectory where you really just, you know, women leaders, different types of leaders, like you seem to be drawn <laughs> to helping those folks get into power. I am a big fan of helping women leaders. I will say working, I worked for Hillary Clinton and it did open my eyes a little to the challenges that women face, which are, I think, unique um, in politics. Um, and I've been so grateful to be at Emily's List and then to be there during this crazy 13 weeks or so when the world mm-hmm. changed and when, um, you know, knock on all the wood, I think we're going to make some history um, and it's going to be very exciting. But I, uh, yes, I am drawn to, um, you know, Democratic leaders. I'm drawn to the sometimes the underdogs, but but people who have um, good, good fights to fight. So. Yeah. You, I, I, we worked together on the Obama campaign, and that was That's right. certainly one where all sorts of different issues of identity <laughs> popped up in politics. Yes. Um, like what we're, yeah. Just a few. Like what we're, just a few. Yeah, just a few. Christina, um, Christina, where are you from? I just trying to remember that. Where are you from? So I am a Marine brat. I am the daughter uh-huh. of a Marine and a teacher, which I it impacts my politics quite a bit. And um, and so I lived everywhere. Um, and uh, but. But I like to say I get to choose my hometown because I moved so much. Yeah. And I choose North Carolina, the whole state, as my yep. hometown. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we're a battleground state this year. So it's pretty exciting to get to talk about that. Yeah, you've been in and out of that place. Yeah, it, it is exciting. Look, I'm happy to have you here because there are very few people in democratic politics who've done all the many things you've done, but also have a good head on your shoulders, right? Like somebody who's not, <laughs> <Someday>. <laughs> yeah, who's not just going to come at it from you know a really esoteric place. Um, I will tell I will tell people though, you also are one of the rare people who those of us who are in comms and press who are like the mouthpiece of the campaign, Christina is one of the people who did a lot of the research. Mm -hmm. And so you're like the brain of the campaign. (laughs) (laughs) And I used to always say when I worked for candidates, listen to the candidate, trust the research. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's good advice. It's good advice. I like to think we keep, we keep people truthy, right? Um, Yes. And I am very, you know, in a world in which facts don't seem to matter, I think that voters still want to hear what you actually stand for and still want to seek out the truth. So I'm, you know, I, I, my research ties remain strong. Um, and I, I still believe in the facts and the truth. So, well, I'm glad that someone right. does, and somebody yeah. uh, who actually understands the math along with the truth, mm-hmm. which is part of what we were hoping you could help everybody yes. understand today. Right? Yes. The, there is election math, which is independent of this idea of every vote counting, um, and it mm-hmm. does. I think the idea of voting in aggregate and seeing what you can do mm-hmm. to make change is great. But you know, because electoral college. Yes. Some some places matter more than others. And you were just yes. talking about how the Nebraska issue right now is, is front and center about and pointing out the reality of what the Electoral College means. Yeah, it's, um, you know, for those who missed it, the Republicans tried to argue Nebraska is one of two states in this country that actually um, that divide their electoral votes based on um, based on their congressional districts. And so you can. Um, split the state effectively. And what has happened recently is the area in Omaha tends to be a more um, democratic area. And so Democrats pick up an electoral seat there in what is traditionally viewed and and historically been a red state. So that's really important because there you go, there's Nebraska. Um, Because in the eminent wisdom of our founding fathers, they set us up with an electoral college that has an even number of Um, electoral votes. So you could end up with a tie. Anyone who's watched Veep probably understands this better than um, better than we learned in history. Um, Watch Veep. I lived Veep. I know. (laughs) It's true. It's true. Um, But I think so what happens is you get the electoral votes by state, except in Nebraska and Maine. And in Nebraska, because Democrats pick up that one vote, Mm -hmm. because the math, it's not that hard to get to the math where that one vote gets Kamala Harris to 270, Donald Trump said, aha, we need to change this then and put pressure on Nebraska legislators um, and the Nebraska congressional delegation to change it so that Nebraska was a winner take all, um, winner take all state. And, And my argument is, I'm, you believe in winner take all? Let's make the whole country winner take all, right? Let's mm-hmm. say the candidate with the most votes wins the presidency, which historically, by the way, 
uh, in the last few cycles has not always been the case. Um, mm -hmm. Some may remember when Hillary Clinton won millions more votes and narrowly mm -hmm. lost the Electoral College. We could be looking at the same thing. Kamala Harris is, is expected. Again, you got to come out and vote, right? Nothing is nothing is given. Um, those who have to actually make the votes, polls don't vote. Don't vote. Um, but um, Kamala Harris is widely expected to win the popular vote. The question will be likely a handful of votes it, across um, what are considered the sort of seven battleground states. And, yeah, the truth is, we if, yeah. you mentioned Hillary Clinton um, in 2016, mm -hmm. but Al Gore 2000, right? The Democrats yes. have won the popular yes. vote in every election since 1992, yes. except for George W. Bush's re-election in 04. Yep. So mm -hmm. um, this is clearly tilted against the majority of the country. Yeah. Yeah. What was funny, when you listen to Republicans talk about this, I was with a Republican pollster at an event maybe 10 days ago, and he said to me, or he said to this group, well, if you take out New York and California, Republicans <laughs> win the sure. popular if vote. If you don't count the votes that I don't like, then we win, right? It's easy. I mean, right. Like those people aren't the state, right? Let's just like those people entire, aren't American. Take out the entire Western seaboard yeah, that we yeah. call one state, which it happens to be one of the top economies of the world That's on right. its own. Just, just let's not talk about that or count that. Millions okay, so there's a different way. Yeah, and by, and by the way, I mean, those people are Americans. A hundred percent. So let's not. <laughs> they let's are not voters. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there's based on how some of the conversation is going, just being a legal, you know, legal American may may not be good enough anymore. But we'll we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, <laughs> some of what what's being said in the in the election circuit right now, Christina. What is then the math or the what they call yep. the path to victory? Yes. For Kamala Harris, like what states mm -hmm. does she need? So we talk about a number of different states when we talk about mm -hmm. the path to victory. And if you consider that all but those seven sort of fall where they have fallen in the last few elections, then there are a couple of paths to victory for okay. Kamala Harris. The first is what, what is sometimes called the blue wall. These mm -hmm. are states that um, prior to Hillary Clinton um, had gone Democratic for decades. Um, and that's um, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Okay. And it is worth noting in 2016. Wait, we said Wisconsin? Wisconsin. There you uh -huh. go. Pennsylvania. Mich Pennsylvania. And Michigan. Michigan. So that's the blue wall. Yes, Those that's the blue wall. And, and it is worth noting that um, those states, if I believe it's some somewhere along the lines of 66,000 votes across those states uh -huh. had flipped in 2016, Hillary Clinton would have been president. 66,000 sounds like a large number. It's not. I want to like to break that down. Um, and if you follow, you know, you should the state state party chairs in these districts, uh, Ben Wickler in these states, Ben Wickler is the Wisconsin chair. And mm -hmm. he's noted, I believe it only would have required one or two votes a precinct in Wisconsin wow. to flip. And Donald Trump would have won Wisconsin. In okay. And for context, a precinct is essentially the one polling station that yes. we all go to, right? So that's at, correct. E at that's correct. where you go to vote, if one more if person, one had person, voted, yes, that's it. Yes. And it could yep. be your neighbor. Yep. Then Wisconsin would have gone for Hillary. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, when you think about that, that's not that that's not that much. It's why you'll see there's a lot of attention in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has the most electoral votes of all of these seven states. And, How many does um, it have? Uh, it has 19. So 19. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's considered, Pennsylvania is considered the ball game, but I'm going to tell you, you can get to the math a number of different ways, but Pennsylvania is a, is a big state. And the challenge here with these states, or if you look at them, by the way, all three have democratic governors mm -hmm. um, doing great work. Two of the three currently have a trifecta, the legislature, Michigan mm -hmm. and, and Pennsylvania, the legislatures and the governors are um, are Democrats, and they have done great things with that, right? Gretchen Whitmer and that um, Michigan legislature um, did amazing progressive work, including protecting abortion rights, right? Mm -hmm. they, they've, they've taken those, um, those majorities and they've done good stuff with them, and they remind people of that good work. Whitmer, Shapiro, still very, and I believe Governor Evers, um, very popular in their states, and so that's you know that's a good thing for us. Hopefully, reminds people of the good work Democrats can do. Wisconsin is a little different in that the legislature is Republican, and so um, they have a split, you know, 
little, little things are a little different there. Um, but in all of those states, you have different areas. You have some that are very rural that tend to be more Republican. Mm-hmm. You have some that are um, suburban and urban. So, you know, you've got a Milwaukee and then you've got a, a Madison, which is a college town. Um, you know, you've got Detroit and then you've got broader rural areas that, that are more conservative. You've got that split really across all of these seven states. And mm-hmm. so where they focus their votes, um, you know, where where you get turnout and where you can minimize um, minimize the the loss, mm-hmm. um, it happens in in different areas. It's why we're seeing different um, stops for the different parts of the ticket. So you may have Kamala Harris in Detroit, um, but for example, tomorrow you know tomorrow the reproductive bus tour is in Grand Rapids. You know you mm-hmm. go into different areas and try and hit those media markets. So that's that's the blue wall um, right now. Polls are all over the place. And I like to remind people, polls are a snapshot in time. They are a guess, right? You're extrapolating from several hundred to a thousand people what you think millions of people will do. Um, but fundamentally, they're what, what people are saying right now that they, that they think they will do mm-hmm. in six weeks or in less in the case of early vote. Um, and so we have to go make it happen, right? Yeah, like well, I mean, as opposed to, right, players, like... Ha- how they yeah. actually feel when it's raining outside, potentially snowing, or right. you know something right. came up at work, That's and right. right this idea of the building up the enthusiasm to go mm-hmm. vote. All right, That's so right. continuing though with this, so that's one path. Yeah, one yep. path. Yep. Um, I think some of the the pundits would tell you that Pennsylvania is thought to be um, the tightest of the three of those, the one that is most likely to flip back to Trump. And that's that's a loss because obviously that's 19 electoral votes, Um, because I believe if she wins those that blue wall and she wins Omaha, um, which thankfully Nebraska is keeping, Mm -hmm. you know, the way it is. um, If she wins all of those, she gets 270, which is exactly what she needs. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's an interesting case, the the Nebraska case. mm -hmm. So, Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was with Jane Kleb recently and we were mm-hmm. talking this through and, you know, obviously reading a bunch about it, but the, the state Senator uh, McDonald, mm-hmm. uh, who, who is the one who stood who did not go with the Republicans to change the seat yep. to a, to a winner take all um, process was a former Democrat, right? Oh, he, oh. So according to Jane, who's the chair of the North Carolina, I mean, I'm sorry, of the Nebraska democratic party, According to Jane, he flipped mostly because of questions around abortion and so some social issues mm-hmm. kind of got him to flip. Mm-hmm. But he was lifelong Democrat. So this guy flipped, but he stuck with the Democrats on this question about how did this get resolved. And what he said when he was asked was like, you know, we may want to change this in the future, but doing it this close to Election Day isn't right. Now, what I understand from other sources is that it's not just that he's doing the right thing. This guy also wants to run for mayor of Omaha. Uh-huh. And Omaha is what? A majority Democratic yes. city. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, so and Omaha as a Republic- probably likes that they actually get to have an impact here. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you want to run for uh, mayor okay. of Omaha, the one thing you don't want to do is reduce the power of the Democrats no. in the majority <laughs> in the city that you might want to govern. And that gets so, to the, the broader point, yeah. though, right? That it's yes. even in states where you know New York is going to go blue. Um, when, you know, they're, they're, Wyoming is going to go red, right? Like these are just some givens. Even in those states, so there's down ballot tickets where yeah. that's where the individual votes, especially again, the precinct, who shows up in your neighborhood, that piece matters. All right. So back to the math. Kay. Say she doesn't get Pennsylvania, then what? Well, I'm here to tell you that we're going to win North Carolina. And that is going to be a part okay. of the path. You heard it here. Um, I'm going. I'm, co- I'm co-signing this with you. You're okay. co-signing. Okay. Yeah. Right, let me give if you. You put your me... chips on the table. I'm going to put my chips. You're going to you're gonna, you're gonna be next to me. I appreciate <laughs> yeah, that. Right. Jamal. Let me give you my rationale here. First of all, North Carolina was the closest state that Joe Biden lost in 2020. He lost it by um, uh, somewhere around 75,000 votes, which sounds like a lot. In North Carolina, it is about 1.4 percent. Um, And it's a smaller percent now because North Carolina is one of the states that grew during COVID. A lot of people moved here. We have a lot of industry. We have a lot going on in this. You got the beaches, you got the mountains, you know, I will do the tourism ad later, but, um, but you've got a fairly low cost of living in a great state to live in. I live here right now. So um, I Democrats did that. their convention there. Yes. They did a convention there for in this reason. 2012. That's right. Um, so can so I put a little so demographic? 
Can I put yes. some demographic, yes, demographic sauce on what yes. you just said? What we've also seen, you should read, there's a great piece by Domenico Montanaro from NPR who looked at yep. who moved and from what yep. states did they move and right. what are they kind of, how do they line up? And I thought one part that was great. I mean, he, you know, 10,000 people from California and X number of people from mm -hmm. New York who've moved to North Carolina. A lot of them have moved there. They work in the finance industry, right mm -hmm. around Charlotte. They work in the research triangle area, mm -hmm. right? Blog and so growing there, what you are, pharma, yep. Absolutely. And so what you're seeing are college educated mm -hmm. whites who are moving from perhaps more progressive states into a state like North Carolina for lifestyle and mm -hmm. family reasons and financial reasons, business, work, uh, employment reasons. And now throw in and the Central American. The graphics. There's a Central American population yes, there, there too. Is. There's a, yes. there's a, it, I'm, you might know better the indicators of what, what's attracted Mm -hmm. migrants to North Carolina, but it's a, it's a significant enough population that you yep. look at this and you're like, oh, you're not near the border. So why do you care about immigration? Yeah. Well, yep. And so what's happening though, what's interesting, I want to stick mm -hmm. on the non-college, the, the college educated whites mm -hmm. for a second. The, you know, that is a population that Democrats over the last two, two or three cycles have become much better at. You can yep. probably tell us better than, than mm -hmm. we can. And so they're better, you're better able to compete among those voters. And as North Carolina has a greater percentage of the state, that fits that demographic, that's right. Democrats have a greater chance as well as a big African-American vote, that's which right. is interesting because unlike Georgia, which we all think of in, you mm -hmm. know, Joe Biden won yes. in 2020, had a larger African-American population, but Georgia is a little bit of an aberration. College educated whites still tend to vote more conservative in Georgia than they vote more progressive. Mm -hmm. So in North Carolina, you kind of have two big populations to, yes. to, to campaign in versus Georgia, where you're really trying to do a turnout game and yeah. shave in a bunch of places. You do. And, I, and, and to, to Nira's point, you also have a growing Latina, um, Latino population. I'm, I'm yeah. specifically, we're specifically focused on the women because I work at Emily's List. But, yeah. um, but I, so, so that's, yes, that's point number two. Point number three that I will give you is um, I believe abortion is how Democrats are going to win this election. It is a major issue. And what I'm going to tell you is North Carolina is a state where, because one legislator flip, flipped parties, um, Republicans got a super majority and over Governor Cooper's veto, they passed and then, you know, were, were able to, to finalize um, a new abortion ban. It is incredibly unpopular in this state. Mm. What is popular in this state is Governor Cooper, who won when Hillary didn't um, and won re-election again um, uh, when, when Biden didn't win the state. Um, Governor Cooper went around and campaigned on this um, on this bill, go. on stopping the ban, on calling your legislators, on doing all the things. Governor Cooper does the work. This is someone who knows Kamala Harris personally, who really tells the story well. Um, and he talks about abortion. I will tell you, you know, again, I work, I work for a lady group. Um, so I don't talk about the dudes <laughs> that often, but what I can tell you is it's a, what's a really great thing is to hear an old rural yeah. Southern white guy talk about abortion in very compelling terms mm -hmm. and he brings people in. Um, so I think that's going to matter. Governor Cooper's work is going to matter. We have a state party chair who is 26 years old, which I got to tell you makes me wow. sad when I say it. But um, <laughs> but she has phenomenal um, she has phenomenal energy. She also has um, she comes from a rural area. She is a field organizer, and she has, with the help of obviously the Harris campaign um, and the party, they have built the biggest field operation this campaign um, this uh, state has seen since um, 2008, which. As, as Nayara mm -hmm. will remember, because I used to ask about it every day on the Obama campaign, the Obama campaign won. Um, yeah. It's the last time Democrats won North Carolina federally. So we have that going for us. But now you're Another there. Thing. Now you're there, Christina. Now That's I'm here. All the I know. That's all the difference. Let me tell you one more thing, which is um, I, I mentioned we lost it by 75,000 votes. I heard a thing today. Um, our primary was after Nikki Haley dropped out of the race. She still got 250,000 votes in the Republican Ooh. primary. So 250,000 Republicans. Republicans who at a point when she was no longer running still wanted to wanted to say not Trump. And so those are people who I think are open to potentially considering and when you consider, you know, considering the Democrats, considering Kamala yeah. Harris, and when you consider what just happened this past week at the top of our ticket mm -hmm. um, with the governor, 
I just, I think this state is in a different space and I right, think so you can see it by the visits. So that would be 16 electoral votes. That's what I say, but you're missing yep. the That's three. Great. You're still so missing still three that you would have got. So what that means is um, basically what happens is if you lose Pennsylvania, you have to win Nevada and one other one. So, mm-hmm. or you you can win any two, so. but Nevada, which is um, a little smaller, Georgia or North um, or Arizona, um, right? Yes, um, no. there's Nevada. Um, and Nevada has fewer electoral votes. Um, How many is Nevada? Six. Uh, thank six. You. Okay. Um, no, so, Nevada's Nevada a state. Plus something else. I spent a lot yes. of time in Vegas there you go. <laughs> doing electoral there you math. Go. I was there doing um, electoral math. Yes. Vegas, you know, well, Nevada in general, yet again, huge Senate race. Um, we feel good about right now. That's um, Jackie Rosen. We've got a lot of electoral stuff happening. Fun fact about Nevada mm-hmm. is the only state in this entire country with majority women legislature, which is we are a majority of the voters, but there's only mm-hmm. one and it's Nevada. Um, you know, it is a it is a purple and two women senators, state US senators and two women senators that's right it is a purple state but it is one where the campaign is certainly doing the work um and and we feel good about it you know okay, um, okay. all right so christina polls, right yes so christina we're gonna have to go but i want to ask yeah. you one question before we go because this is i think a big question i hear this all okay. the time when i'm okay. talking to family members when i'm talking at events people want another question answer okay. this question what's happening with the white women <laughs> right. Oh so yeah. 2016, yeah. We're the worst. No. Hillary Clinton wasn't able. No, this is, yeah. listen, this is some of my best friends are white women. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016, mm-hmm. uh, Donald Trump wins more white women in 2020 than he does in 2016. Are we on track to see that trend continue no. in 2024 or have we gone back? Are we no, a, cu- the a couple, a couple things. Um, no, I think, you know, we will still see not as many as I would like, but I, but I think that Dobbs changed everything. I mm. think that what we have seen for suburban women, for independent women, um, for those white college educated women, mm-hmm. um, they understand what's at stake now. We saw this in our polling at Emily's list was, um, you know, you you tell people Donald Trump could overturn Roe and they think that's a bad idea, but they don't vote on it because they don't believe it. Yeah. When it happened, they were like, oh, and now they have a better sense of what's happening. That's impacting Republic. This is the reason that Donald Trump is trying to convince people he won't actually sign, you know, like, ah, Mm -hmm. no worries. You know, this is the reason you have Republicans doing the same thing. The polling is real. The, The change is dramatic. And I think that when we keep you know, hammering this issue, voters, um, white, white women, um, that it, it helps quite a bit. Awesome. Great. So this was great. We had a little electoral math. We answered one of the big hovering questions over there the electorate. Go. We got to spend some time with our good friend, Christina Reynolds. Thank you for being here. Great to see you all. Sorry for so much North Carolina, but come visit me. You know, you we can love see that for place. <laughs> I like, you know, I'm one of the people who loves North Carolina barbecue sauce. You know, it's a controversial topic, this North Carolina barbecue sauce. Well, Vinegar yeah, there's, versus... you know, there's even two types of barbecue here. So you got to, you know, this is, these are tough choices that you have to make. <laughs> I know, I know. I like to go do a taste yeah. test. We'll have to come down there, there and, come on uh, down. and do it together. All right. Thank you Thank so much. You Jamal, this is this is what I found so fascinating about the election math that Christina was talking about and how it connects back to what we were just talking about, the browning of America. The idea that we have 41 million new voters. Uh, by this election, the majority of the voting population will actually be under the age of 45. It always used to be, oh, seniors vote and young people don't. But Taylor Swift overnight registered 300,000 voters. I doubt they were in their 50s, right? So this new population that we have, and it's more brown, America's going to be majority minority by 2040, all of that is, is, is playing into which states are being focused on to limit access to the ballots. It's this idea of immigration in North Carolina, of Latino votes in Nevada and Arizona, it's all connected. Yeah, it's absolutely all connected. And I got to tell you, it, it is... 
I got it's it's one of the things that worries me, right? Because as the country yeah. changes, we've never really seen a democracy that's gone through this kind of uh, diversification at the same time. And as the country changes, there are people who are really bought into the old America. It's like, you know, the old America, we just can't quit you, right? This idea that, you know, this 1950s Harriet, you know, Ozzy and Harriet America, I didn't even watch Ozzy and Harriet, even in reruns, <laughs> um, you know, but I've seen these images of, you know, the little family, like sitting at the table, doing whatever with the house coat. Like, this is not the America that most people have grown up in. And we just don't know it. I mean, that was the, I always think about <laughs> the 1950s and 60s. The only diversity on television at that point, other than like, I don't know, Amos and Andy or something, <laughs> was uh, Lucy and Desi, right? <laughs> was I Love Lucy show. Yeah. And on that show, it was an interracial marriage, but they never kissed and they didn't even sleep in the same bed. <laughs> right? So they were only really married. That, and that was like it's some big concept. And, and, and Desi Arnaz today would be checking the box white Hispanic, right? When you have like the ethnicity, <laughs> which one are you? Like clearly that's a Cuban American thing that he'd be doing. It's, you know, how we count people, how we judge people, how we, how we self-identify, all of that does play out. And of course it's playing out in our politics. The one that really got me from this week, and I mentioned it um, in our conversation with Christina, J.D. Vance, right? He's really like riled up at this rally and he talks about, uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, legal migrants or illegal. It's like, you know what? I don't even care if they're, if they're legal. Right. I'm just like, oh, I'm sorry. What? Sorry. Sorry. Man married to South Asian woman say what? Like, <laughs> oh, you, you said it out loud. What we have all kind of heard in the undertone or the signaling, which is it really is about maintaining a very particular look about America and not about the legality of how people are actually getting here. And just remember, the guy, this, the guy that Vance works for, Donald Trump, has been saying this for years. People just didn't think he was really serious about what he was saying. One of the first things he did when he was in office was uh, the ban at the airports, right? It was a travel ban. The second thing that he did when he was in office was that he the child separations on the border, when he was putting kids in cages on the border, and there were people who were like showing up yelling at those of us who were unhappy about it, saying that we were wrong, right? For being upset that we were separating kids at the border. And Donald Trump said he wanted to limit immigration from what he called shithole countries. Those shithole countries happen to be people where black places where black and brown people lived. Mm -hmm. And he wanted more immigration from places like Norway. Hmm. Interesting. Less from Somalia, more from Norway. Well, so you let's, fill in the blank. Let, let's fact check a little bit of Donald Trump there. Of the immigrant populations in the United States, the population that has contributed most to the economy with high salaries, the highest educated population, Nigerian Americans. It's actually not, people think Indian Americans, they're up there on the list, but it's Nigerian. And he banned migrants from that country, right? Uh, Somali immigrants, many gathered in Minnesota. It's leading to the diversity and you're like the democracy of Minnesota. That's why he was triggered by Somalia. So these are all come back to the idea of how America looks, but also what could potentially keep a certain class in power for the future because they're afraid of where the population is actually going. So the end, at the end of the day, Nayara, I think, I think um, from our conversation with Christina, mm -hmm. from the stories that we've talked about today, this is a real question about how we wrestle through this election to make sure every American's vote counts and that people of color in particular have their votes counted and that we aren't embarking upon some second Jim Crow type yeah. style government where governing, where we are limiting people's ability to have their votes counted in some of the most important ways in the most important elections. I think that's what the Trump forces are up to. And I will just end it with this thought then, Jamal, that voting is the most fundamental right that we are given in the Constitution. This is the way that we are told that we are able to elect the people who will help govern and keep us together. So yeah, every vote counts and we should make it easier for people to access the ballot and be heard. All right. Well, I want you to be heard on this particular podcast every week. So I want people to listen. Tell some friends about it. Come and check us out. Uh, we are here uh, to keep talking about this. So tell all your friends to come and check out Trailblaze.